Well, hello everyone. I bring you greetings from your co-workers and colleagues at Lipscomb University in beautiful uh, Music City, USA. Uh, I speak uh, several times a year and uh, I have never been introduced by someone who knows me so well and who has known me for so long as Foy Mills. And it's true, uh, we have, uh, we have um, spent a lot of time together and have traveled a lot and he has seen the best and worst of me and um, I have stories on him so he needs to be careful about telling stories on me. Uh, well, this morning we're going to spend some time talking about being Christ-centered in the academic enterprise. Um, your president uh, reached out to me uh, shortly after he was named uh, and uh, asked me if I could come and visit first with the board, and we had a wonderful visit uh, this summer, uh, and now to visit with representatives of the faculty. So Christ-centered education. Um, if you've been in the game as long as I have, uh, then you're probably familiar with the work and writings of this gentleman, Arthur Holmes. Uh, in the early 1970s, he published a book entitled The Idea of a Christian College, and it was uh, partly, I think, an indictment of what Christian education had become by the 1970s. Uh, it was an apology for Christian colleges in general, and maybe a roadmap for what Christian colleges could be. Uh, I, I like this quote about, uh, about Christian education because I think that uh, Dr. Holmes was keenly insightful about our purpose. So if you look at it, over the years, various reasons for existence have been given for Christian colleges, sometimes protective or apologetic, sometimes pietist or missionary, sometimes vocational. Yet underlying it all was a basic conviction that Christian perspectives can generate a worldview large enough to give meaning to all disciplines and delights of life. I don't pretend to know the circumstances that gave birth to Lubbock Christian University or what the vision was in the beginning, lo, those many years ago. Perhaps the school was born out of a sense of being protective or apologetic. Perhaps the school was born out of a sense of carrying the Christian mission forward not only here in the panhandle of the Southern Plains, but also around the world. Or perhaps it was designed for folks to incorporate, for your students to incorporate a sense of faith in their vocation. I don't know. But what I do hope and that I do believe is that your job, the job of all of our Christian schools, is to create within our students a worldview that gives meaning and purpose to life not meaning and purpose to their vocation or to their family or to their church, but meaning and purpose to all things that their life touches upon. Well, the question then is, how do we do that? So a few years after Arthur Holmes, we have David Dockery, and some of you I'm sure have read some of the things that Dockery has written. Now he is chancellor of Trinity College. He was the author and sort of the main proponent of this concept of faith-informed teaching. And listen to what Dockery says about our job. The challenges facing Christian colleges and universities cannot, by, cannot be neutralized simply by adding new facilities, better campus ministry opportunities, and improved student life programs, as important as these things may be. And they are important. And you would be foolish not to invest in those things. They are very important for carrying out our mission. But they exist as things that are on the boundary of our mission. They are not the core, the center of our mission. They exist out on the boundary. They are tools that enable us to do the things that are at the center. He goes on to say, our 21st century context must once again recognize the importance of serious Christian worldview thinking as both necessary and important. Dockery agrees with Holmes. It's about creating within our students a Christian worldview that gives meaning. Now this is what he believes, and this is what was put upon many of us when we began our careers, maybe in the 80s and 90s, was this sense of, I believe that Christian faith informed by spiritual interpretation, theology, philosophy, and history has bearing on every subject in academic discipline. While at times a Christian's research, the scholarship that we're celebrating today, in any field might follow similar paths and methods as the secularist, 
Doxology at both the beginning and the ending of one's teaching and research marks the works of Christian educators from their secular counterparts. He says it is about the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We connect our work to, the ble- to, to God and we, we call blessings on his name. Now, I can remember being a young faculty member and, and teaching everything in those early days between environmental ethics to general chemistry, to molecular biology. And I can remember being asked to write a a philosophy of teaching where I was encouraged to actually articulate specifically how I would connect my Christian faith to general chemistry. And I I have to confess that those exercises often felt forced. It often felt, in a sense, unnatural, certainly Praise God for chemistry. Praise God for economics. Praise God for English literature. Praise God for every discipline represented in this room. And we ascribe honor and glory to him. But if we want to try and say that the way that we're going to form a Christian worldview in the hearts and in the minds of our students is limited to just doxology, then I think we are mistaken. And so we need someone who can help us to understand what the center of our work really looks like. And so we have this gentleman, John Ortberg, and perhaps some of you are familiar with his writings. Ortberg is famous for his defining the boundary of faith and juxtaposing it to the center of our faith. And I think that we can apply his boundary-oriented versus Christ-centered thinking to what we do here in the Christian college context. So look at what Ortberg says. While a center set approach may help us understand how we define discipleship, it remains true that boundaries are indispensable for life, including spiritual life. Divinity schools may need to define the doctrinal boundaries for someone to serve on the faculty. There are many boundaries that we need to define at a Christian college. That's an example of one of them. Parents may need to be able to say certain behaviors are out of bounds for their children. Churches need to do the same for members. Paul does this when he warns the church in Corinth about tolerating sexual immorality. And perhaps the most famous warnings in religious literature are given by Jesus himself about hypocrisy. In fact, it is precisely because Jesus is so clear about the center. And this is what's important. The center is to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. He is so clear on that that he is able to be clear about his warnings when someone is violating love. You know, all those boundary issues are important, friends. All of those things that Dockery acknowledges as important, they are important. But simply calling out doxology at the beginning of our work and the ending of our work isn't enough to create a worldview that will allow our students to stand in this culture. No, we have to be a people that are characterized by this radical sense of love. The center of what we do at Lipscomb University, our provost is famous for saying he only wants to hire people who love God, who love their discipline, and who will love our students. You know, we have to do the boundary things as well. But the thing that's defining our work in Nashville is love. And if we want to carry out God's mission in a Christian college to form a worldview in our students, it begins with love. I really appreciate Carl McKelvey. Carl was our executive vice president at Lipscomb for many years. In his retirement, in his retirement, he has, he has run our Center for Spiritual Renewal. He is a workhorse who never gets tired. This is what he says. Christ-centered education is not secular ed- education with add-ons. Where we might say we're just like, or just as good as, UT. By the way, that's 1794 UT, Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> now, if you want to pretend like it's the new kid on the block down in Austin, you're more than welcome to do that. But we're not pretending like we're just like UT, but with add-ons. We have the add-ons of chapel and Bible classes, and that's what makes us Christian. Those are boundary issues. 
That's not at the heart of what makes us a Christian institution. No, Christ-centered higher education is different from the core because it is centered around the Christian in the classroom approaching their discipline as a Christ follower, sharing it with help from divine insight in a relational way with their students. It's about the relationship. This is what it looks like. It is loving God with everything you have and then shining that love into the life of another human being. So this morning, I want us to spend some time thinking about that and answering two questions. So these are the two questions that when you leave here today, I want, I want these questions to be on your mind. I hope that they spark conversations with you in your departments. The first question, why did I choose to serve at Lubbock Christian University? I want you to spend some time thinking about your why. This summer when I met with your board, I asked them to imagine why anybody would want to do what you do. We spent some time brainstorming and thinking about why anybody would want to do this. This thing that you have decided to do, to be at this place, at this time, doing this work specifically. For some of you, it may have been a while since you thought about your why. The second question I want you to struggle with is, how I can create Christ-centered interactions in the classroom and beyond. Not just to remember why you're here, but to think about how you are going to personally go about forming a worldview in somebody else. Now, Foy tells me he shared with you my Venn diagram. This is something that I developed years ago to help students as they struggle with, what am I going to do with my life? How many of you have those conversations with kids? They come to your office. I just don't know what I'm, I don't know. I, you know, I'm studying this, but I don't know. And so we sit down and we work through questions. And I ask them, well, tell me, how are you gifted? What, things has God, what, what, what are the things that God's placed in your life that make you special and different? And then I say, you know, what about your passions? What are the things that, when you don't have to do anything, when your mind can just relax and and you can let your mind wander to wherever it, it goes to. Well, what are those things that draw your attention that, you're not, you don't have, that you don't have to think about? The things that you get excited about, that give you life. And then lastly, what do you value? You know, people value all kinds of different things. Wealth and status. That's why all of you chose to work in higher education, Christian higher ed. Agency in time family, human relationships, so many different things that we value. You know, I, I tend to work and have worked primarily with pre-professional students through my career. Lots and lots and lots of college kids that want to be doctors and dentists and physical therapists and pharmacists. Most of them have a gift for understanding science. It's natural. Most of them have a great passion for helping people. And if they're honest with themselves, most of them place a high value on status and money. Nothing wrong with status and money if you use it well. So I want you to think right now for yourself, why are you here? If you were to answer those questions, how did those questions lead you to this place at this time to do this work? You know, I've been doing this for a long time, friends, and and it doesn't take me long when I step onto a campus and begin interacting with people to identify the ones that are here for different reasons. And I can usually sort them into three basic groups. The first group at, most, at many Christian colleges that I'll identify are the ones I call the refugees. These are folks who love their scholarship and have a great gift for it. But they're also folks for whom the world is too difficult to navigate. And so they find their ways into these Christian communities where it's safe and it's easy. They're not challenged in their belief system. They're free to pursue the things that they're passionate about without molestation. 
I have found that the group that this group is often characterized by people who have an excessive amount of grievance who contribute little to building the community but enjoy it immensely <coughs> and who rarely have meaningful mentoring relationships with students the second group I call the builders this group is they, they are here for the express, express purpose of building the Christian community they're not confused about their mission they're not confused about what they're trying to accomplish these are the people that create the community that the refugees enjoy they're the first ones to pitch in and to say I tell me what you need me to do I'm all in for this school they have great effect on the community and they are looking for strong mentoring relationships and then you have the third group I call this group the disconnected they used to be in the second group they used to be a builder but they've become disconnected from their why for 12 years y'all I, I led a department of biology and biomolecular sciences if you include adjuncts and graduate assistants, faculty and staff, I had 24 direct reports. I, imagined, I managed a combined annual budget of about $2 million. 350 undergraduate students, 35 grad students. I was responsible for everything. How difficult would it be for me to become disconnected to my why and just focus on all of these urgent things that I, I have to do? In my current role, it's a very simple word, strategy, isn't it? <laughs> I'm responsible for finding ways now to make connections with external constituencies, for raising money, <laughs> for faculty development. It would be so easy for me to get lost in the day-to-day -day urgent things that I have to accomplish that I could get disconnected from my why. This third, work, this third group started out doing this thing for the right reason, but somewhere along the line, all of the busyness of our work began to slowly disconnect them from the reason that they decided to do this in the first place. So if you, if you come away from today's time together with anything, is that you will make an effort to reconnect with your why. To be reminded of why it is that you chose to do this thing at this place, at this time. Well, it's one thing to be reminded of our why. It's another thing to know how to do it. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about how I do it. Like Paul, I, I would invite you to copy me. <laughs> So how do you do it? Well, I'll tell you something. My wife and I have been married 35 years, and we hold hands. When you see us walking across a parking lot, we're walking hand in hand. If you see us at church, we're holding hands. If you see us in the mall, we're holding hands. I decided a long time ago that as long as we were holding on to each other, it would be really difficult for us to lose track of where the other was at. We're connected. The thing that I do to hold hands with God, the thing that I would encourage you to do, is to sanctify your work every day. Now for me, sanctifying my work every day means that I get to work really early. I arrive at the university between 6.30 and 6.45 a.m. I make coffee for our office. I spend time in the Word of God. Today it was Numbers 14. Then I take a prayer list that's got, right now, 56 names on it. Some of them know I'm praying for them. Some of them do not. I begin to work fervently through that period of prayer. And I conclude by giving God my day. It's my way of staying connected to my why. I sanctify my work every day. I don't come in thinking about that urgent thing that I have to take care of before 9 a.m., the most important thing for me every day is to sanctify my day and give myself to this work. That's the first thing. I encourage you to do that. The second thing I encourage you to do is build effective relationships. 
I made a vow several years ago that I would not have any casual interactions with students. I never, you never see me having a conversation with a kid on the sidewalk or in the student center, in my office, in the classroom, in a hallway. You will never see it. It may appear casual to you, but it's not a casual conversation. Foy used to see me in action when we worked together at ACU. Every single conversation has a goal in mind. From the start to the end, I want every kid that I encounter to know that, that I love them. Love's at the center. I'm trying to create loving relationships with other image bearers of God. Because guess what? When that kid knows that you love them, and I don't mean in a soft emotional attachment, sentimentality sort of loving. I mean a John 3.16 kind of love. The kind of love that means that I'm willing to sacrifice for you because I want what's best for you always. When a kid knows that you love them, then you have an opportunity to speak. We're taught as Christians to speak the truth in love. You can't hear the love outside of you can't hear the truth outside of a loving relationship. So work hard at being intentional with your interactions, even when it's difficult conversations. You know, I train a lot of kids who are gunning to go to med school, and I have to hold them accountable academically. Even in those hard conversations, they never go away thinking, you know, that guy's out to get me. They always, my goal is for them to always know that I love them even when they fail. And when you do that, it opens the door. You know, I, I chose these pictures up here. These are pictures from the last five years. Just, I picked some. Every one of those kids had a different story. The young lady on the base of the softball team there, that was her senior day. I was standing in as her father. Raised in Houston, never knew her dad. The only male influence in her life was her maternal grandfather. She came to Lipscomb and found somebody that loved her sacrificially the way a daddy ought to. She's in Waco now as a nurse practitioner. Young man at the bottom, Zuriel. Parents deported beginning of his senior year. He's a DACA kid. Had nowhere, nowhere else to turn. But he knew that there was somebody who loved him. The girl I'm standing there in the middle, it's right after I had baptized her, raised by two very successful parents who were flaming atheists. She was taught that Santa Claus and Jesus Christ are the two most insidious fictional characters in the Western world. But then she met somebody who loved her radically. The young man at the top, first generation African American, had no idea, no idea what to do with his life. And then the young man at the bottom, Michael, Buddhist. The only thing his father cares about is money. His parents sent him to Lipscomb so that he could get a Vanderbilt University education at half the price so that he could become a trial attorney. When I asked him, what are you doing here? He said, I'll put up with the Jesus stuff to get a high quality education. That picture was taken two years after I met him. You see folks, all of us are gonna have to look in the mirror someday and ask ourselves, what do we do with our lives? I mean, I'm not arrogant enough. I mean, I am arrogant. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not arrogant enough to believe that my contributions to the academy through my scholarship will mean a whole lot a hundred years from now. I'm a scientist. My contributions, they, add, they, they are added into a larger narrative of science over time and they just add to what we know. And so what will the point be? Well, I'll tell you, for me, when that day comes. 
And I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, Kent, what did you do with your life? I'll start seeing all of their faces, y'all. Every one of them that God used, that God used me to touch them. You know, we can talk about, we can talk about building a worldview. But what we're really doing, what we are really doing, is transforming lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, this is the heart of your president. So we were texting back and forth back in the spring. And I was like, well, you know, what do you want me to come and talk about, Big Mac? We, we, have, we have little pet names for each other, me and your president. Mine is? G Daddy, okay. If you beat somebody enough in the racquetball court, they start calling you Daddy. I got to compose myself again. This is your president's heart. He wanted me to come and try to help you to understand, get some insight into his mind. I know some things about Scott McDowell. We are similar in a lot of ways. We're both gigantic men. We both outkicked our coverage when we chose a wife. And we both desperately, and I mean desperately, want to make a difference in the lives of young people. And your president recognizes that at this university, you are the people who will do that. Yes, we want a Christ-centered athletic program. And yes, we want to have a Christ-centered co-curricular, and we want a Christ-centered residence life program. But the people that are going to transform lives on this campus, that's the faculty. And I want you to know that your president recognizes it. He believes in you. Look at what he says. Christ-centered just means Jesus as the center and object of our work and that we are always moving toward him as our focal point, embracing his words and his ways. This is also informed by a contrast of Christ-centered versus boundary-orienting. We were, we were discussing in that text stream uh, Ortberg's work. The Pharisees are the classic example of being boundary-oriented. If you press them, and Jesus did, they would tell you that it was all about the Shema, love God with all you have. They also knew loving people was the second commandment, and yet they had devolved into a focus on boundary issues of circumcision, circumcision, ceremonial washing, Sabbath keeping, because they were clear markers of who was in and who was out. It manifests in Christian college settings when you focus on chapel requirements and Bible requirements and ignore the, look at what he says, this is your president's words, the most significant interactions that happen in every classroom and every office. What you do is the most significant thing that is accomplished on this campus. Your love of God manifested in a love for your students is the most important thing that's gonna happen on this campus. And this is what he ends with, I want Jesus to be the center of all that we do at LCU. And I think that the most critical place for that to happen is in our classrooms, our core business, and our most profound place of influence. There's somebody here from marketing that needs to be somewhere. Because it is, gives you keen insight to the man and his vision for the university. Well, I ask God in this very moment to bless all of you in your work. I pray that God will place his love in your heart so that you can focus your love on these students. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you all. I didn't know you were going to talk after me. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I always get the last word. <laughs> So I want to say thank you, uh, and I will keep my comments brief. You're going to hear more than you want to hear from me this week. But thank you. Thank you, first of all, Monica Williams, for putting this together and for being – she's been a part of the Inauguration Week Committee, and I thank you for all that and for the, the focus on scholarship this week. 
uh, this is our core business, and I, I'm grateful. So thank you for that and for those that put this luncheon together. I also say thank you to you, every one of you faculty members, because absolutely, the things that he's quoting me on, I absolutely believe you are carrying forth the core business of this institution. And for years, Kent knows that my shtick was, well, 90% 90, 90 of students' time is outside the classroom, and that's mine. He would like to always remind me, well, yeah, but the ones that I have anything to do with are spending a lot of their outside the classroom studying for my inside the classroom. But the reality is I recognize this is the core business. And it's all about, as he's described, the, the, your why, and that we're here to, to change lives. I, uh, so thank you, and I recognize that. And as he was calling us to reflect, one of the things that I reflected on is why I am doing what I'm doing. And part of why I'm doing what I'm doing is because of the hope of transformation that we kind of all lean into. He said we got a lot of things that we're alike. That's right. You know, I'm, uh, we're both big guys. <laughs> we have tender hearts. We can cry at the drop of a hat, and we never wear our hat too tight, as my dad would say. But what I'm really grateful for is all I've ever known is the transformed Kent Gallagher. I've only known the product of Christ-centered higher education because I didn't know the guy before he was influenced by people like you. It dawned on me we were over at my house for dinner after the, the board retreat and as will happen in those contexts, we got telling stories. <laughs> and if you want some good stories, G Dog, <laughs> G Daddy, all these little pet names, I don't like what you said about beating me enough on the racquetball court and I call you Daddy. <laughs> it's got to have some other. I got to come up with a better story for that. But uh, we got talking about his journey and how he came to be where he is. And there were some, it was a circuitous route. It led through Abilene Christian University where he got kicked out of school. And it led to some real hard times in Florida. And it re led through some redemption with his daddy who frankly had not done real well as a dad early on. It led to some reconciliation. But my entire experience with this man, Foy, has is, is been a transformed man a man that is a, a brother in Christ, a man that loves the Lord with his, all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that started on a Christian college campus where people cared enough to, to not just share the discipline in brilliant ways. Bledsoe is actually quoting Richard Felix from Azusa Pacific by way of me, and I'm going to get on Craig Bledsoe for quoting me by way of Felix without giving Felix credit. Felix was the president before... Two, three presidents back at Azusa Pacific University. He said, all parents want to know is, do you love your Lord, do you love your discipline, and do you love your students? And so I had this relationship with a friend now that spanned 20 plus years where we encourage each other constantly. He prays for me every day. I pray for him when I remember to. <laughs> and we share texts back and forth and we are iron sharpening iron because of people like you in classrooms like ours that took their work seriously. So thank you for what you do. And, you know, maybe 30 years from now, uh, one of your students will be giving a speech to inspire other scholars just like you to reconnect with their why. So blessings on you. Thank you for what you're doing. I think closing remarks come to Monica. 